just a lot tougher because you knew the person, you knew a little bit about them. You'd probably bumped into them, talked to them several times through the year and a half, uh, two years that you trained. Uh, it was it was so neat knowing the people you were with and knowing who you could bank on and who would uh, back you up and what kind of person they were and everything. But it was on the flip side of that, it was also very bad because when you lost somebody, you were losing somebody that you knew quite well. And <clears throat> I remember at Lo Zhang when, well, first, my, my squad leader was the first person killed in 198th Light Infantry the seventh day we were in Vietnam, James Kaler. And uh, he was killed when we were on bridge security there. And I thought of all these people over here, it had to be my squad leader. And uh, I had to, the, uh, I was uh, made to or ordered to pick his body up to fall in the morning out of the water and put it on the helicopter. And it was just uh, uh, my first real taste of war, and I, it, it was more than I wanted. And so when we, uh, as, as time progressed and we got to Lo Jing, uh the first person that I knew that was dead was uh, James Lopp. And he had been my best friend, and he had hitchhiked to my home with me in Yoakum uh, several times from Fort Hood. And, you know, we did a lot of walking and a lot of hitchhiking and a lot of talking, and we really got pretty close to each other. And he came home with me several times, and when Sergeant Bartley told me that day that Lopp was dead, it was uh, it was just unbelievable. And the pain I felt was more than I ever want to repeat again. And and then as the day progressed and I found out more and more of the guys and, you know, obviously each one of us knew the other one. Like Alan said, you know, we may not have been the best friends with them, but we knew who they were. And, and you know, we'd gone to the beer hall and all sat around a table and drank beer together and told stories. And we were on details together, may have been guard duty or KP or, or whatever. And we had worked with, with uh, each other throughout that year. And it was a real painful, uh, hard to talk about at times feeling that we have. Uh, they were, they were our brothers. Uh, you know, you always hear that story. There's nobody closer than men that have served in combat together, and I can honestly say that's very true. And uh, you know, it, it's hard to try to describe that kind of feeling to somebody who's never been there. And people can imagine, and they, I know they try to imagine. But until you've lain with somebody who's bleeding to death or who's dying and uh, and you know what their dreams are and their wishes and uh, how they feel about their family and so forth, it, it's a tough, tough thing to lose a friend like that. And one of the more odd stories that, uh, to me, that's associated with a company like Larry Botch, he trained with us. Uh, we all got to know him real well and everything, et cetera, et cetera. We went to Vietnam. We spent several months in Vietnam uh, with him out in the boonies and, and et cetera. And then at some point in time, they realized that so many of us had trained together and come into the Army together that they needed to somehow spread, get some new blood in there so that so many of us wouldn't... Uh, need to be sent home about the same time. So they took a bunch of guys and one of them being Botch and sent them to other, uh, to other units and Botch was sent to the 196th. And it's so funny to me, he comes to our reunions, he fits in great, we all love him just like we love you know everybody else that was in A Company. But he to this day says he does not remember one person in the company he went to in the 196. Uh, it's just, I don't know, it's something about training all that time together and then especially uh, the combat in Vietnam that made us really, really close. And uh, when you lose somebody like that, like Kaiser said, it's like losing a brother or somebody that's even closer than a brother. Yeah, absolutely. You know, losing my best friend, Gary Stating, I mean, that's a cloud that's hung over me from then on. Yeah. 
and I don't I guess I'll never get you know used to it or anything else it's just uh it's hard to describe but uh band of brothers is <laughs> pretty much describes it yes absolutely uh lop and stating you know are guys that that Alan and Alan and I and of course he and stating me and lop and there was others. I lost four people in my squad, which is a lot. Uh, but uh, James Lopp was one that there, every day of my life I see his face and hear his voice every day. And Turner was another one, that red-headed Turner from Jackson, Georgia. He was, he was my machine gunner, and I see his face and hear his voice, and he was a carrot-colored hair. Uh, he had hair the color of a carrot. And he was real white complexed, and he couldn't grow a mustache. Everybody in my squad had a mustache, but, but Turner, and Allen knew him very well, and he got killed, and uh, it, it was just a real tragedy. And you know, not a day goes by that I don't see he and Lop and Kaler and uh, Phelps, uh, and hear their voice, and that stays with you for forever. Yeah, and it's always you talk about Turner. It's always struck me. It's funny, you know, I, I knew Turner fairly well. I didn't know him that well, but for some reason his death, maybe it's because he was walking point, I don't know, but for some reason his death just irks the hell out of me. And, I mean, at the same time he was getting killed, I was experiencing three near near death situations, probably the closest I came to getting killed, just one after another in a row, and I, maybe that made a difference, but for some reason, Turner's death just got to me almost as much as stating and, and Paul's death got to me. Uh, you just get close to people, yeah. and you never get over losing and you, and them. You can't accept the fact that they got killed. No. Uh -uh. And, and, and Turner was a guy that, he, he, did, he looked like a little powder puff, but he was tough <laughs> as a nail, and he would hurt you if you messed with him. And I told him, told him and uh, Madison to shut up one time. They were squabbling, and it was hot, and we hadn't slept in a couple of nights, and we hadn't eaten all day, and the flies were so thick you couldn't, just couldn't keep them off of you. And there was no breeze blowing, and we were walking down this little dry creek bed, and they were just saying all kind of obscene things to each other, like you know about ten year old kids do, you know. And I turn around, and I said, "Both of you, shut up before I spank your butt." I said, "Like you act like little kids." And Turner had a fifty round belt or a hundred round belt in his machine gun. And he just turned it on me and flipped it off of safety, and he said, you shut up, MF. And I said, okay, no problem, I can shut up. And, you know, I didn't get mad at him. For a, for a minute I did, but I think if I had done anything stupid, he may have pulled the trigger. We were all at our wits' end. We had had enough of each other. We had had enough of no sleep, no eating. And, uh, you know, but after that I wasn't mad at Turner because I knew... I knew him and I trusted him and uh, he told me to shut up and I did it and that satisfied the whole issue and then next thing I know everybody's getting along and they're not arguing and fighting anymore and you lose somebody that that's, that's that high spirited and, and, it, and it stays with you forever. Uh, you know, I wasn't really up there close enough to feel like I can give a definitive, definitive answer. But I feel like, you know, if we hadn't been so close to one another, it might have been quite a bit worse. You know, if anybody had started cutting and running, it'd have been hell to pay. They'd overrun us and killed us all, or just about all of us. So I think being a close knit group made us uh, a lot better group. Yeah, I, uh, I I definitely agree with that. We were we were very close, and as we went out into the rice paddy, Allen's platoon stayed back in the tree line, and second platoon was on the left on the line, 
and would be on the what east side yeah and I, uh, east, yeah. third platoon and then the, the company commander captain brennan and the artillery forward observer lieutenant swank and the, all of their rtos and fo's were uh, at the end of the second platoon line and they were be, uh, between third platoon and second platoon platoon and i was right at the very edge within from here to that door from captain brennan as we moved across the rice paddy. So as things started happening, I was uh, pretty close, and Captain Brennan told us to pull back. And there were several other people wounded out there, and I I remember telling him, uh, we can't pull back, we've got wounded people out here. And he said, you've got to pull back, and you've got to pull back now. Well, I hadn't seen what he had seen. But I knew one thing, I was raised up to know and, and trained to know that you didn't leave wounded people to die by themselves, but I also didn't know the conditions. And as it turned out, Captain Brennan was right. Had he not done that, we would have all died. But uh, being close together like that and fighting for each other, I remember crawling across uh, uh, Polino, and he had been wounded, and he said, man, I, I've been hitting the back, and I looked, and there was just a little scratch. But, you know, I knew him so well and was so close to him, I knew that something more was wrong. It looked like something had just barely scratched him. But I knew something else was wrong because he couldn't hardly do anything. And uh, so many, so many others. Uh, I remember I was, when I finally got wounded, I remember I was out of my head and I was crawling along and I was bleeding and I was going the wrong direction. Lehman Holloway and a guy named Johnson and a guy named uh, Avant crawled out there. They, they were back safe in the cemetery, and they crawled out when they didn't have to and got me turned around, put a clean bandage on me, and got me headed back in the right direction. And that's the way things went all, all during that battle. Guys were coming out and tending the wounded guys. When, the guy, when those guys were already back in a safe area, they didn't have to go out there and do that. And had we not known each other and been so close, surely all of the people that were wounded would have died. There's no doubt in my mind. Man. I, I love the reunions. It's, it's funny to, to hear somebody say this at this point in time and this point in time in my life, but I really don't ever feel safe, completely 100% safe, until I'm with these guys at a exactly. reunion. I mean, I feel safe all the other time and everything, but I don't feel 100% safe. And being at these reunions makes me feel safe. And, I, uh, you know, I think it's helped me deal with a lot of stuff. Of course, I'm just getting older, too. Maybe that's helping. Uh, but it's so wonderful to be around these guys and see them. You get a few little uh, points clarified in what you, things you didn't remember or thought you remember, blah, blah, blah. So they're, they're neat. I love them. One, th one thing that I, that I think about on, in the reunion is exactly what he said. The only time in the year that I feel, I guess, emotionally safe is when I'm with these guys. And, you know, we talked about this on the way up here that that my biggest problem is when the reunion's over, I don't want to leave the guys and, and, and usually go through a day or two of depression after leaving the guys. But if, if I need one of them, they, they know who I am and what I am. They know what I would do if they had a problem. And the same token, I know what they would do if, if I had a problem. And uh, my family, every one of them has told me, hey, if you ever have a need of anything, if your family needs anything, let us know. And so you feel, you get that from the reunion. And, and it's amazing. A company is pretty unique in that we've all meshed together. Uh, all of our wives unbelievably meshed together. Our kids, who are all grown now, mesh together and have so much in common. And it's just really a unique situation. I don't think there's many others like it. Agreed.